What's up guys, today I'm happy to share with you one of my favorite opening gambits. It looks completely absurd and yet it's extremely effective. I won numerous games, especially Blitz games, using exactly this gambit. I'm talking about the so-called Mangarini Gambit, which you use as white against the Cillian Defense. The Cillian Defense is one of the most common chess openings and therefore you definitely gotta be prepared. And here, you've got an absolutely ridiculous idea, pawn a3, followed up with the move pawn to b4. And again, at very first sight, it looks like you're just violating completely all of the classical chess rules. You don't develop your pieces, you don't fight for the center, you don't try to castle your king, and all of that stuff. But, um, to j just to try to prove that this idea is actually legit, even Magnus Carlsen used it once in a World League Championship, and he actually won that game. So it's not completely ridiculous, but of course, it will very well shock your opponents. Now, in this position, in most cases, Black understands that the only potential idea of this weird move pawn to a3 is to prepare this b4 advancement, right, b4. So, they're gonna go knight to c6, trying to take control for the square, and they were going to play this move anyway, so they think, well, why not do this, and simultaneously I'm gonna stop this b4 move. But white plays it anyway, pawn b4, which kind of gives your opponent an idea that you are a complete beginner, you don't know what you're doing, not only you're playing weird moves, you're also losing material, and in this case black will uh, grab this pawn. And black are kind of forced to take it, because if not, you're gonna push this pin forward, push this one forward and attack the knight and, you know, it's, it's quite annoying for black. So th they're gonna probably take this pawn. That's what they do in most of the cases. Now you start playing pawn c3, gaining little temples by attacking this knight. After knight goes back, you play pawn d4. And at this point, you already can see some of the ideas behind this opening gambit. So first of all, uh, you've got some assets. You've got these two beautiful pawns in the center of the board. Moreover, one of them is ready to be pushed forward and to attack this knight once again. Also, your rook is getting active from its initial position, which is also nice, and you have a lot of open lines and diagonals for your pieces. Therefore, you can already see that this gambit actually makes sense. Kind of like the Evans gambit, you know. Uh, now, what is black going to do here? Well, since they understand that you're probably gonna play pawn d5 and kick this knight away once again, in, in the vast majority of the cases they do play the move pawn d5. And it's hard to believe that this move pawn to d5 is kinda wrong. I mean, I can't really say that this is an error, it is not. But it just puts black in such a dangerous position that after that very often they go down so badly, even title players very often are defeated within just a couple moves. So here's the trick. You take here on d5 and after black recaptures, you play your knight out to a3. Continuing your strategy of playing weird move one after the other. So once again, you violate all of the classical rules, you put your knight on the edge, we know that. A knight on the rim is deemed and all that stuff, but in this case, you still keep playing dumb moves which are extremely effective. Now, the idea behind this move knight a3 is rock solid. You're gonna play knight to b5, and from here, your knight will jump to c7, delivering a triple fork to black's king, queen, and rook. That's a really nice plan. Here's the problem for black. Even if they realize what you're about to do, it's fairly difficult for black to do anything against that. Let me show you some statistics. Now we are in a Lee Chess database where we can see the stats around this variation. And here in the bottom right corner, you can see different moves tried by black. And most of them are losing mistakes, including all the top choices such as pony 5 or knight of f6 or pony 6 These all moves are losing badly for black. And it's actually quite funny that after a series of absurd moves, you're reaching the point where black's position is so deadly dangerous. Moreover, even if I turn on Stockfish for a second, you can see that it still gives a plus score for white, despite white being a pawn down, and Stockfish usually is materialistic and says that, you know, extra pawn is almost a win, but in this case, it still says that white is slightly better, even after the best move according to Stockfish, which is queen a5, also an absurd move. It's hard to really <laughs> use any human terms to describe this variation because, you know, in response to absurd moves of white, black is supposed to play another absurd move, you know, queen a5, also ignoring development and dancing around with a queen. Uh, but in reality, as you can see, nobody really plays queen a5, they play other moves, which we're about to, to talk about right now. All right, let's start with the top choice of black, the move pawn to e5. A standard move in any other opening, a losing mistake against the Mangarini variation. Because it doesn't do anything against white's intent knight to b5, threatening knight c7, forking black's king and queen. After that, in order to somehow take control over the square, 
uh, black can try a couple of things. For example, queen can go back to d8. In this case, yes, they took control of this seasonal square, but now your d pawn can move forward. A very common theme for all of these variations. Your pawn goes forward, kicks this knight away, and also gives you some more attacking potential here. After the knight goes back somewhere, does it really matter? Your pawn keeps marching forward, and now from d6, we were already new in the threat of 9 going here to c7, and once again it's very difficult for black to stop it. Again, what I like about this is that your threat is so simple, but you just keep pushing it and there is not much black can do against it. Um, what they usually do is knight a6, trying to cover it with the knight, but you don't have to hesitate to sacrifice an exchange over here, because after this you play knight to c7 and you're gonna get your rook back, winning a piece along the way. Moreover, after king goes to d7, you don't even have to grab the rook, although you could, but it's even stronger to just hunt the king because it's now deadly exposed. You can go queen a4, and now you simply start checking the king, trying to checkmate it. After king takes over here on d6, which is forced, you play another fun move, knight to e8. You deliver a check with the knight from e8. I mean, what other opening variation can you name where you deliver such a check from e8, right in the middle of the black's camp? Uh, now, the king is gonna go somewhere. It's not that easy for the king to hide, because we are also having this resource of bishop a3, checking from this side. So... The knight is also taking away this square, therefore the king cannot really go back. Uh, if it goes king to e6, now we bring the other bishop forward and deliver a check that way. Now the king has to keep marching forward. I mean, king e7 does not help. Again, bishop a3 is nearly a checkmate. Black would have to sacrifice a queen, so that's not the solution. The king would have to go forward, but you just keep delivering checks. Play queen c2 check, and it's easy to see that the king is nearly checkmated. Let's say pawn e4. You just keep making checks. Again, at first sight it may seem like the variation is fairly lengthy, but it's easy to play all these moves because you just keep delivering checks and keep attacking black skin, trying to checkmate it. It's a very straightforward plan. And after king goes somewhere, let's say king to e5, I mean, if king takes over here, you just take over here, and that's gonna be checkmate in a few moves. So, in most cases, black played king to e5, and the finish of this attack is really beautiful. Here you play a move pawn f4, delivering check with a pawn, and after black recaptures, you play a very casual move, the move that you play in virtually any chess opening, move knight takes f3, but not too often you'd play this move out with a checkmate. <laughs> That's really funny. I couldn't easily re recollect any other example where you develop your knight to f3 with such a, a tremendous effect. And here is what I love about this the most. It's not some rare subline, we just have just analyzed the most popular moves of black against the Mangarini variation, and they lead to this exact position where you checkmate black in this nasty way. Alright, now let's have a look at another attempt of black to save their position after still they play pawn e5, we're going over the main line. Uh, white jumps knight b5, threatening knight c7. Black plays in this case, instead of moving the queen back, which we already know doesn't help, Sometimes black tries bishop d6. Seems like it makes a lot of sense. Black develops a piece and also prevents this knight going there to c7. In response to this, you play another spectacular move, bishop to c4. Sacrificing your bishop over here and obviously attacking black's queen. And black can't really accept the sacrifice because if queen takes c4, follows to knight to d6 and somehow white's knight found the other route to steal fork black's king and queen and black is losing here. Therefore black can't go there. Let's take it back which means that black has to play some other move with the queen, and the queen has to maintain the guard of the bishop, therefore the only move is queen e4 check to white's king, so that at least temporarily black is solving the problem. You just cover your king, now this bishop is still hanging, the bishop also has to control the c7 square, therefore the only move would be bishop to b8, and now, I mean, you, your position is just so dominant, you're so way ahead in development that I'm pretty sure that almost any normal move would win. Uh, the strongest would be queen b3. You just keep attacking black's king over here. Not easy for black to defend it. The knight cannot go out and defend it that way because we are controlling this square. Therefore, black will be forced to go back with queen to g6. And again, any normal move would win the game. For example, d5. We know that this kick is always very unpleasant for black. You push your pawn forward, kick this knight away. It has to go back. Let's say knight goes to d8. And now we can play bishop to a three to cut the black skin off so that it can't castle anymore and uh, overall it creates a lot of dangerous threats let's say if black goes knight of six by the way generally speaking it's very good to remember this motif when you have your two bishops standing near to each other in the direction of the opponent's king very often it gives you lots of different ideas of how to finish your attack successfully it happens against the castle king just as well 
Uh, by the way, if you're interested in that subject, I've got a free masterclass, which I'll link down below the video, where I'm talking about this subject, how to develop your attack in the middle of the game, and more details. You can check this out later. For now, let's just come back to the Mingur innovation. And here, for example, thanks to these two bishops, White can play queen to b4, and Black can't stop the very simple checkmate in threat, queen to e7. I mean, Black can't do something to stop that, but their position is completely lost anyway. Another common move of black in this critical position of the Mangarini variation is developing their knight to f6. Another standard move in any other opening, a losing mistake in the Mangarini variation is a common theme. You see that all the normal moves just don't work here. We still play knight b5, and that's the issue. Black didn't do anything against this threat. Now, the only way, normal way to solve that would be to use the queen to do so, something like queen to d8. And now White has a really beautiful follow-up, which is almost a forcing win. Again, it's hard to believe, hard to comprehend, but you almost have a forcing win here for White. And it starts off with our usual move, pawn to d5, kicking this knight away. We're not afraid of Black taking this pawn, because at the end, we always have this nasty fork knight to c7. Regardless of what Black does, if queen takes d5, knight goes to c7 straight away, forking the king and the queen. So black loses. If black instead tries to take with the knight first, we are happy to sacrifice our queen temporarily, and after that we still deliver all the same fork, and at the end of this line we're up a piece. We're still winning. Which means that black simply can take this pawn and they have to move their knight away. Let's say knight e5. Looks good at first to centralize the knight, but we continue with the move bishop to f4. Attacking this knight, and more importantly, if the knight goes away, this bishop helps us to still bring our knight over here to c7, delivering this fork. Therefore, black can't afford that, they have to somehow defend this knight. And how can they do that? There aren't many good options at all. The only one is this weird move knight to d7, but then you just keep attacking this knight, won't remove it, so we play knight to f3. Our idea is, as long as you remove this knight, your knight is free to go there to c7 with the support of your bishop. So we just want to eliminate this knight from e5. And Black has to keep maintaining this knight over there, so they have to play another weird move, pawn f6. They don't really love that move, but they have to play just to defend this knight somehow. Now, although they solidified their knight, we just change the route and we play knight to d4. And from here, the knight eyes a new weakness, this e6 square. And after that, this will still support our other knight to go over there to c7. Again, again, what I love about this is that your simple, brutal persistence pays off here. You just keep pushing that idea of delivering this fork with your knight to c7. You just keep pushing that idea and it works. Strange, but again, I, I, I don't know why this variation is such an unusual one, but that's how it goes. Now, Black has to address this threat, knight going to e6. In order to do that, let's say they're going to go knight to c5 in order to you know open up the bishop, control with the knight, something like that. Now, this knight is getting weakened, and so you can take it, and after that you play queen h5 check. You take advantage of the other weakness which black made by pushing their f pawn forward, and now for absence of this pawn we can deliver a check. Pawn g6 is forced, now queen takes e5, picking up the pawn, and along the way we're attacking this rook over there. The only way would be to move the rook away, and finally we are playing knight to c7. Time for a little party, the knight is landing there, we're winning the game. But that's not even the end of this fun story, because after black plays king to f7, you could take the rook, but as we have seen in other variations, you don't even need to, because in this case you can have just a checkmate and attack against this dude. Knight goes to e6, attacking the queen. If the knight takes, as you can see, that is nearly a checkmate. Quite funny. If not, in most cases, they're moving their queen away, they notice this threat, so they move the queen away, which leads to another neat checkmate, knight to g5, and that is a checkmate. Which is, again, one of the most common moves of black lead to this absolutely brutal attack with this quick checkmate. I hope that you are as excited about this Bangarin variation as I do, so let me show you just a couple more variations so that you are fully prepared and you know what to do if black tries something else. Okay, uh, by the way, this pawn a3 followed by pawn b4 variation is not something completely out of the box, because instead of a3, there is a quite well-known win gambit where white plays b4 right away, sacrificing this pawn, and very often the, the following move is pawn a3. And the win gambit is a very known theme in a, in a chess opening theory. That's why I wouldn't really say that this is something completely groundbreaking, but nevertheless, this definitely gives uh, a completely new life to this gambit idea. So pawn a3 starting off this Mangarini variation. Black goes with knight to c6 and then we follow with the move pawn to b4. Once again, even Magnus Carlsen used it, which becomes a pattern. I mean, Magnus just keeps following our opening dirty tricks. What, what the heck is going on here? 
Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> of course, he knows what he's doing. Um, knight takes b4, c3, pawn d4, threatening pawn d5. In order to stop that, black usually goes pawn d5. Now we take it over here, queen takes, and our knight jumps to a3, eyeing to this deadly route all the way to c7, delivering a triple fork. Now, what else can black do? Well, another common move of black is the move pawn e6, just trying to develop, again, as, as, as usual. In this case, you still play knight to b5, as always, eyeing the square. Black goes queen d8, trying to control that. And in this case, uh, there is something that you gotta be aware of, because at first, it looks like the move to be played is the move bishop f4. And this is a perfectly fine move. It actually gives white a dominant and probably a winning position here, because black can't really solve once again this move knight to c7. But black can sacrifice a pawn, and this way they're blocking this diagonal, and although your position is great, still at, at the very least black could somehow stop this knight from jumping over there to c7 and forking the king and winning the rook, you know? And so instead of that, you can make this idea work and make it impossible for black to stop it completely. Let's take a couple moves back, and instead of the move bishop f4, we just sacrifice our pawn over here to d5. And after black captures it, we now play bishop f4. And the difference is black can't push the pawn from e6 to e5 anymore for lack of pawn. And they simply can't stop this knight from coming to c7, and you just win. And here's how you beat an advanced level opponent. Let's say your opponent noticed the major threat, and black may think to himself, all right, if that's the threat, what if I simply play a6 and shut down all these knight b5 ideas? Well, in that case, uh, although you could still play that, actually, which is funny, because you know, this pawn is pinned, but it's even stronger to change uh, the route for the knight and to jump over here to c4, aiming for the square b6, and from there it just delivers yet another fork, in this case, to the queen and rook. And that is still unpleasant for black. In most cases, they're gonna go queen d8, going back, you know, in order to prevent this fork from happening. Now, as always, we're happy to push the pawn forward to d5, kicking this knight away, and it has to go back to b8, now, at this point, if you're looking at the position, it feels like black tried to play against you, but, you know, realized that something like didn't really work out and they started to put all the pieces back. Maybe they're about to resign or something like that. Anyway, after 10 moves of the game, black still has the perfect setup, right? Um, now, we play bishop to e3, continuing with our right threat of knight to b6. And if black overlooks it, cool, you're, you're gonna win the game. If not, they'll play knight to d7 to cover that square. And black keeps dancing around and keeps all, and their position is completely clumsy. Just look at that. They're dancing around with their qu queen and knight, uh, not really making much progress and keeping all other pieces blocked. Uh, for that reason, you can just develop. You just play knight of three. You don't really aim to checkmate black right away, but you say, hey, dude, you, you got to develop somehow, you know, and, and you're in trouble. Because if not, I'll finish my development within a couple moves and then I'll have a deadly attack. What can black do? Um, if they're annoyed by this knight, Maybe they'll play b5 at some point, and they often do. It feels active for black, but it actually backfires, because your knight is not going to go back. It goes forward to a5, threatening knight to c6. And actually, it only adds fuel to the fire of your attack. Because if black goes something, I don't know, knight of 6 now you land your knight of c6. Now it's even stronger than it was before. It hits the queen. And if queen goes somewhere, now we can take advantage of the pin and play bishop takes b5. Black is completely pinned and paralyzed and restricted in every direction possible. I mean, it's time to resign, actually. And of course, Black can't really take over here, because that would lose the rook over here, adding one more pin <laughs> to the Black's paralyzed position. If you're playing the Sicilian defense and you haven't watched my video with the top five best opening traps in the, in the Sicilian defense, I would highly recommend that you click over there and check this out. It's one of the most viewed videos on this channel. Uh, also, if you want to learn how to develop your attacking skills overall, I would recommend my free masterclass by clicking the link at the top over there. Wishing you a great rest of the day. Bye.